So first, thank you. Um, thank you for having me here. Um, it's a great opportunity to present um, some of the work that we've done um, for our CNR, CRCNS grant over the last two years. Um, uh, so the, the work that we do in our lab um, focuses on sensory perception in the auditory system. Now, you could think of um, sensory perception broken up into various stages where initially you have feature extraction. So imagine this image right here, feature extraction. Um, maybe you extract at higher levels um, in, the, in, in the system. You would extract dependencies, more complicated dependencies. And ultimately, um, the, this information would be put back together to form the perception of objects, being able to recognize um, you know, different visual images or sounds um, as a whole. Now, you can think of these analogies within the auditory system. And uh, um, we're going to be focusing on earlier parts of the auditory system, a little bit earlier than cortex, although we do do work in cortex as well. Um, and um, on, on the one hand, at the very early level in the cochlea, sounds are broken up into individual frequency components. By the time we're, when you get to the auditory midbrain, um, which is one of the structures that we're actually studying um, in this grant, um, sounds are actually um, sensitive to modulations. Modulations are basically fluctuations in the power of a signal over time or over frequency. So in speech, um, speech as I talk, the sound is turning on and off. That's happening as my mouth opens and closes, which is relatively slow. But also vocal fold vibration um, creates onsets and offsets that are very fast as a whole. And neurons in the structure are actually sensitive to that. Um, we're not going to be talking about today about the physiology. We're going to be talking about a series of human experiments and how we're using models of this structure to actually be able to, to explain perceptual sensitivity. So I, I chose this intentionally here. Um, we have a couple participants um, who are going to illustrate what we're really after. We're trying to understand um, listening in complex environments. And so I'll, I'll let the, the participants demonstrate this. <laughs> So I, I think I, I think this really illustrates the, the, the difficulty in doing this. Um, this is a real you know world task. Um, everybody's talking. Um, we, we have Nakam and Jonathan there. Um, they're, they're actually showing us that they could actually do this. Despite the fact that there's many other people talking, there's, cl there's clatter in the background, there's a bell going on, um, and, and it's something that we do on an everyday basis. So the, the big question is how does this happen and how, you know, what kind of information ultimately contributes to this? So we're going to be looking at, in particular, two type of auditory cues that are really critical. The frequency content, which is explained by the spectrum of the sound, and ultimately the modulation content, spectral and temporal modulations, again, fluctuations in power, and how those influence speech recognition and noise. And what I'm going to really talk about is talking about a model that we're actually using based on midbrain um, representation, which is partly motivated by other people's and our own data over the years um, in order to try to explain perceptual sensitivity. So we've chosen a, a perceptual task where we're just going to do digits. We choose digits because there's minimal semantic or lexical type information. Um, you do random, you know, in this case, going to be a sequence of three digits back to back. Um, they're going to be presented in a variety of different noises um, that we'll see in a second. And um, we've, you know, overall, we've covered 34 participants. We have 10 different backgrounds. These are real world background sounds, as well as white noise, which we use as a control. And all of these, at least the initial part of the data that I'll show you is at negative 9 dB SNR. Negative 9 dB, that, you know, the, the, the noise level is actually much louder than the, in terms of power than the actual speech. Um, so this is actually a, quite a difficult task overall. So let me just illustrate. Um, so here is an example, three um, spectrograms. These are actually cochlear model representations. So we use a cochlear model to describe these. Um, this is a case right here where we have a 9, negative 9 dB. Um, and I, I just want you to listen to it so that you can get a sense of the difficulty or how difficult it is to recognize the digits. Oh, let's go back. Um, I, I doubt anybody recognized the digits in there. Um, um, it, in fact, if you, if you just do it in quiet, it's actually very easy to do. 
eight, two, seven. Um, so I think that illustrates how difficult this task could be. That partly depends on the sound, and on the one hand, it depends on the statistics of those individual sounds. So what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to manipulate the individual sounds. On the one hand, I could take the, the, this original background sound here. This is speech babble. And I have the spectrum of the sound. Um, we also have this um, panel here which shows the statistics of the modulation. Um, so it's telling us the amount of power at different temporal and spectral modulations. That's evident in the sound. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to manipulate these sounds in two ways. One way we're going to do it by randomizing the phase structure of the sound. What that actually does is it preserves the original spectrum, but it whitens and distorts the modulations. On the other hand, we're going to go through a secondary manipulation where we spectrum equalize the sounds. So now the sounds have this sort of 1 over F type dependency. And across all the backgrounds, they have the same spectra, but nonetheless, the modulations are preserved. When you actually listen to these sounds, they, you, you could actually hear the original sound content in there. I'll just... It changes the overall pitch of the sound, but nonetheless, the, the content that determines the, the, the actual sound is evident. So here's um, some example results that we get. The, the first thing you know is that there's quite a bit of variability in terms of the listening performance, um, the digit recognition performance across sounds. Um, it turns out some of this is actually dependent on the spectrum, but some of it is actually dependent on the modulation content. So here's the results for the phase randomized. In that case, note that the spectra are the same to the original, but you've changed the modulations. And you see in certain cases that are really interesting, like the speech babble right here, you could actually see that there's a drastic increase in performance, indicating that the original modulations actually had a really dramatic effect on your performance as a whole. Other sounds sort of go the opposite way. The construction noise, noise actually hurts you by removing the original modulations. The original modulations are somehow helping you. And then on the other hand, um, when you spectrum equalize, note that now, if you go across all the backgrounds, they actually contain the same spectrum. So any of the differences in that case are actually due to the modulation. So we could actually replot this data by subtracting the original minus the phase randomized accuracy and the original minus the spectrum equalized. Note that along this axis, you're seeing effects that are due to the modulation. And along this axis, you're doing, seeing effects that are due to the spectra. Um, note that certain sounds, um, like this blue sound right here, the modulations are actually helping you. Um, or it's a, so they're actually, the original modulations actually make it easier to actually listen to the, to the speech, whereas other sounds, they will actually hurt you. But you also get complementary effects happening in the spectral dimension as well. All right, so I think th this goes to show that both um, the spectrum and the modulation content are important. Um, I think we know that from previous studies. It hasn't been quite done with a vast array of natural sounds in this way, but there is a lot of evidence that modulations are important in masking as well as the spectrum of the sound. And so this brings us to the question of whether we could actually build models based on physiology that would actually allow us to explain some of this behavior. And uh, my students have been, I have a number of students that have been working on this. Um, Feng Rong has been developing some of the midbrain models. Alex has been applying those models to actually basically use them to predict the, the perception. And Chu's eyes, um, she was the one that actually collected a lot of this behavioral data. So the, the first stage of the model that you could consider is going to be a cochlear model. Um, so we take a sound. Um, the sound basically gets put through a filter bank. Um, this is a nonlinear filter bank that's modeled based on cochlear physiology, and it generates a time frequency plot, as you see here. We could ignore time and average over time and generate a spectrum like I've shown you already. And what we're going to do is we're going to use this as a feature to try to predict behavioral accuracy. Um, so just to illustrate the, the basic idea of masking, so you have a speech spectrum. The idea is that you're going to get interference by some sound. If the, sound, the, the background sound is weak, there's going to be very little interference right here. On the other hand, as you make that background sound louder, the interference gets a lot stronger, and it's going to create more problems for, for listening. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to take the spectra from both the foreground and the background. And initially, we do um, dimensionality reduction with these um, to try to prevent overfitting. Um, and then we're going to use the logistic regression model to try to predict the accuracy. And here's the original data again. Um, this is actually the data um, plotted where we have the validation data. We have the training data, and it's actually all of the participants. So that, again, there's 18 participants in there, and then there's 33 sounds total as a whole. And when you do this, you can see that there is some predictive power. Um, on the other hand, it's not great. I mean, you, you do predict um, about half or 50, almost 50% 50 of the variance. But the, the question is then, could you actually do better? I think this tells us that the spectral representation, just accounting for frequency content, only accounts for some of the information that's gonna be necessary um, to explain masking. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna build uh, a model based on auditory midbrain physiology. Um, this, we use spectrotemporal receptive fields, which are filter functions that describe the, the filtering of the sound, the, the spectrogram, and break it down into individual, um, you know, different resolutions. And again, we're gonna ignore time. We're gonna average it into power across three dimensions. So in this case, the three dimensions, well, I'll go ahead and show it here. The three dimensions, frequency in this direct dimension, temporal modulations in this axis, and then the other axis is spectral modulation. Um, again, the idea here is that we're gonna have interference, but we're gonna have interference in this high dimensional space. We're gonna do the same exact approach, linear regression. And now the question is, how much better is the result? Well, note that it actually improves quite a bit and you predict nearly 90% of the variance. All right, so I'll show you um, this last figure here, um, um, which shows you the actual weights. We can take those weights and project them back into the relevant spaces that we care about. Um, the red is all the participants. Note that there's multiple lines, so those are the 18 participants, and the red indicates the, the effect of the background. Note that the background has an inhibitory type effect, so it has a negative set of weights, um, that are tuned to about 1,000 hertz. Uh, it very much looks like an audiogram, indicating that in that frequency range, that's where you have the most masking effect. On the other hand, in the modulation dimension, um, you could actually see that there is um, substantial, appears to be masking occurring for all the participants in these low frequency bands as a whole. All right, so um, uh, in the, uh, you know, because of time, I'll um, forego this. Um, I do have a poster that, um, that we could go over this more, but we have also a way of explaining the effects of SNR um, for, for signal to noise ratio as you make the power of soft, you know, the, the background sound louder or softer. Um, we could actually explain those relatively easily with a log linear type regression. All right, so I think as a whole, this demonstrates that the spectrum and the modulation statistics of natural sounds um, are really critical in masking. Um, we, we've been able to, um, to use this model, this auditory midbrain inspired model, to actually demonstrate um, or actually be able to predict um, some of the perceptual sensitivity. Uh, and it turns out this very relatively simplistic model does quite well. And then as a whole, we also said that, um, although I didn't really show it, um, we could actually predict SNR effects um, as well um, in a relatively simple fashion. Thank you, and then um, poster 34 or 44. Um, and then of course, all the people that have been involved in the project, this is with Ian Stevenson and Heather Reed, and uh, in red, Shuzai, Fengrang, and Alex, um, they're the ones that actually did the work. Thank you.